The United States finds itself in the midst of an information war with an old adversary. This week, national security analyst Tom Nichols will help us understand the contours of that conflict, the role of storytelling in it, and also the implications of what he calls the death of expertise. That's this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University, alongside my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. So each week we'll sit down with a wide array of creators, analysts, artists, and scholars to understand the stories we are bombarded with every day. This week, we're joined by Tom Nichols, a professor of national security affairs at the Naval War College, a former Jeopardy! champion and author of the soon-to-be-published book, The Death of Expertise. We've got a lot to talk about with you, Tom, but I know we've got to do a little housekeeping first. Although you work at the War College, all of the views that you express today are yours and yours alone. Correct. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Uh, there's a lot that we do want to <laughs> talk about, but I want to start with uh, some stuff from the headlines. Uh, uh, the U.S. intelligence community has said that uh, Russia tried to influence uh, the, the 2016 election in the United States, uh, and the public shorthand for this has been that Russia hacked our election. Uh, but it's bigger and more complicated than a hack, isn't it? That word, uh, hacking, is really driving a lot of people up the wall because it it raises this image of the Russians actually getting into electronic uh, voting computers and, and turning the numbers and adding 5% for Trump and taking away. That's not what happened. And I think it's important to say that. I think we all use the word hacking as shorthand to mean getting into a system where you don't belong somehow, whether it's by uh, phishing or um, by stealing a password or whatever it is. And that's what happened in this case. So in that sense, did the Russians hack the election? Uh, no, they didn't change the outcome of the election. They didn't get control of Indiana's uh, voting computers. Did they go into systems that were protected, that they were not supposed to be in, to steal information that they then weaponized to use against the American electoral process? Absolutely. There is no doubt about that. And I think, you know, if you, if you want to call it something other than hacking, that's fine. I, I personally refer to it as a direct attack on the American political system by the Russian government. And this is, this is an example of political warfare, information operations. Absolutely. What, um, does it fit into a broader, uh, a broader understanding of Russian foreign policy and Russian foreign policy objectives? I, it, it does in the larger sense that the Russians, uh, because they're driven not only by um, an animosity toward the West, which has been pretty consistent throughout their history, um, but also out of a sense of inferiority, uh, that they'd like to see our system be as ramshackle and as um, derided as their own. In other words, rather than come up to the level of a Western election, they want to drag Western elections down to the level of a Russian election. Mm -hmm. So it does. On the other hand, what strikes me about this attack is how unprecedented it is in its brazenness and its openness and its direct assault on American political institutions in a way that even the Soviets in their day were careful not to do. There were rules in the old days during the Cold War, and one of them was that you didn't do something like this. You certainly didn't. Now, that's not to say that the Soviet Union didn't engage in all kinds of disinformation mm -hmm. and sneaky tricks and trying to compromise politicians and all of that great old stuff from the spy movies. Right. But this kind of a brute force attack uh, with weaponizing information that is clearly stolen, using a barely veiled cutout through WikiLeaks, was, it, it's really shocking. I mean, it really was an amazing change in Russian foreign policy. So, so what's changed? Why, why now? Why this particular approach in 2016? I think there were several reasons. One is uh, it was low-hanging fruit. They felt they could do it and they could get away with it. Uh, I think on this, the, the Russians feel they have nothing to lose. 
there is nothing really in the Russian-American relationship that they value, that they want to keep alive. Um, they had ready-made co-conspirators and people like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Um, all of the pieces were laid out on the table. It was just up to Putin to make his move. And there, there was no reason not to, really. I like your word brazen because I think that's a very accurate description. I think when you say brazen, you can conclude that Vladimir Putin had knowledge of what was going on. What is he thinking today in the Kremlin? Looking at what has transpired, what he either engineered or condoned or whatever the word is, and you can exp what is he? What is Vladimir Putin thinking? I think he can't believe his luck. <laughs> I, I think he's really. I think he's probably amazed that he's gotten as far as he has in the space of just five or six years. Um, you know, as a as a Russia uh, expert, my worst call professionally was to believe 15 years ago that Putin could work out. That maybe Putin was part of a new generation of guys. He'd worked for the mayor of. St. Petersburg, he seemed to be an unassuming character. Uh, the question we all have is when did that change and when did Putin turn into this guy? Now maybe we were wrong about him then or maybe he changed in the interim. But certainly over the past seven or eight years, maybe even since around the time of 9-11 when we sort of pushed him away uh, after he offered help uh, when America was attacked, um, he, he's definitely changed and I think now he's looking and saying, boy, you know, if in any other world, I'd be the most successful Soviet, not Russian, I'd be the most successful Soviet leader in history because I've done more damage to the West yeah. than Andropov or Brezhnev ever did. So, so what's his end game? What, what is he trying to achieve right now? One thing I think is important to understand about Putin is that he's not a very good strategist. He's an excellent tactician. He knows how to win individual battles. He, know, he can seize Crimea. He can get himself embroiled in Ukraine. He can meddle in the American election. I think he tends to be short-sighted that way. So when you ask what his ultimate goal is, I think even he's not sure other than two overriding concerns that I, I think he has. One is to stay alive and stay in power. Mm. It's important to remember that Vladimir Putin is an autocrat who is, as to use the old expression, he's riding the tiger and he can't get off. He has to keep his people fearful. He has to be seen to be doing heroic things and fighting the West, even when the West isn't really fighting back. I think the other thing he wants to do is something that all Russian leaders have always wanted to do, and that is to divorce the United States from Europe somehow, to make the United States retreat back across the Atlantic and to leave Russia as the dominant regional power in Europe. And so far, I think he's been succeeding in that. What role does storytelling play in all of this? And, and let's start with the, the story that Putin is playing, because he's telling a pretty heroic story. Yes. You know, he, to use the, the, the image that we all have, he rides the tiger bareback. <laughs> his country is, is facing some enormous economic difficulties. Its political structure is completely broken. There are dissidents who sometimes surface, sometimes are able to say something, and sometimes aren't. He has a lot of problems at home. Does his story, of this heroic tiger riding guy help him at home stay in power it does because it's wedded to a second story that's always there in the russian narrative which is the heroism and bravery of russian leaders and their people and this very insecure narrative of victimization and conspiracies right. and plots and a west if you talk to people in russia they they really believe that uh the west is vastly more obsessed with them than we really are, um, because it's, a, it's an explanation for them. It's a story they can tell themselves about why their lives are, are so unfortunate. Uh, why don't they have enough hospitals? Why don't they have enough roads? Uh, why is their life so short and unhealthy? Their infant mortality rate so why high is their and so well, forth. Why, are there, why do their men you know, die in their, in their 50s? Um, Alcoholism, some, of course, being a huge problem in mental health of, as well. Of course, and, but why so much alcoholism? Because of the desperation and the sadness they've been driven to by this evil West that is constantly outflanking them at every turn and uh, taking away their rightful place in the world and undermining what would be a much healthier economy and so on. They, that way they get around the fact that essentially their, their economy is dependent on exporting raw materials like oil. So can he stay in power with the story he's telling? Sure he can. For how I, long? I mean, I know you, you don't have a... 
Until he doesn't want to. Until he doesn't, until he either, actually, I, I think part of the reason he's gone this road is because after he stepped down uh, some years ago after his second term, he made a calculation that he would never be safe. He's kind of like a mafia don. Very only, in, only in The Godfather does the Don retire and then play in his garden with his go with his grandchild, like like Marlon Brando, you know, and sort of die among your tomato plants yeah, in yeah. sunshine. <laughs> that, that's not really. I mean, Tony Tony Soprano, the American version. Tony Soprano had a much better line about this uh, when he said during that series, he said, "Look, guys like me either end up dead or in jail." And I think Putin has figured out as long as he's president, he can he stays alive and he stays. Uh, out of whatever trouble he could possibly be in. So I think he's decided to do that. So how does, how then, how does the West, how does the United States push back? Well, on this, I think we've had a bipartisan failure of Russia policy for over 20 years uh, because we have only two modes of dealing with Russia, to try to embrace them and treat them like a normal European country or to push them away and treat them like an enemy. Mm. And I think uh, the pushback, now I, I, I've resisted for years the idea that we are in a second Cold War with Russia, but now I'm forced to accept we are in fact in a second Cold War with Russia. And I was one of the people that for 20 years resisted ever saying that. I wrote pieces where I said, don't use that term. It's not true, uh, but well, it, it is true. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy it's, too. But we're here now. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think one thing that I, um, of course by the time uh, this is broadcast, we will have a new president, um, but there have been some uh, rumblings about President Obama, for example, trying to out Putin's personal wealth. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be something that, that I would like to see uh, happen, because I think this is, again, a very personalized system of power. In, in other ways, I don't think you want to push back in ways that too directly hurt the Russian people because they don't get a lot of say in this. I think there's always the problem right, that's a very good point. of fighting back against an autocratic government because then you end up hurting people who, who really had no choice in the matter. So I think what we're doing, sanctioning, uh, going very specifically after particular people in the Russian leadership, I think we could um, out more of what Putin personally has stashed away all over the world. Um, but beyond that, I think we also have to reinvigorate NATO. Putin has a Soviet-era hangover about NATO. He hates it with a passion. He hates the word. And I think we have neglected NATO for too long. Well, you, you said, though, one of the things that you said up front was that, you know, Russia had essentially weaponized information. Mm -hmm. uh, is NATO, is the West, is the United States uh, playing the same game? Is, is the West engaged in a, in a political warfare equal to that which they're being assaulted by. Not even close. We're not even showing up for the game. Um, if, if, you know, half of the game is showing up, we've already forfeited because we really don't strike back uh, and fight against things like Russian uh, dis... I don't even want to call it propaganda. <laughs> I want to call it disinformation, mm -hmm. fake news. Um, well, there's, you've spoken elsewhere about a very specific example. A year ago, there were reports that the United States was going to transfer nuclear weapons from NATO bases in Turkey to Romania, and it just wasn't true. It just wasn't true. The can, whole thing was... Can a, you walk us through that, sure. that case? Sure. Um, the Russians, a uh, Russian news agency like Sputnik, started calling around saying, hey, uh, we're hearing this. Which, of course, is the quickest way to plant a story, right? It's, right. A, it's a, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> I heard you're beating your wife. Right. If you stop, well, well, you know, wait, I didn't. Um, and so they started calling around, and they couldn't get the story underway. They finally found a guy in Europe who put it on a website that said, uh, you know, so multiple sources confirm. Of course, none of the sources were named. The whole thing was made out of whole cloth, but the point was to get it into the blogosphere. It then started appearing on other websites. Again, websites run by ordinary people or even as fronts mm -hmm. uh, with no real, they're not edited websites, they were websites like, you know, Joe's blog. Just well, repeating. now it's just repeating it and repeating it. And then the echo chamber started. At that point, it had appeared enough times that um, the British tabloids started picking, a few of the British tabloids, Breitbart Europe picked it up. Well, now there's a kind of second tier of poorly edited uh, sensationalistic media that picked it up. At that point, the Russian media swooped back in and said, oh, look, mm. the Western media are reporting this. Well, it's not. There, it was an echo chamber. Then it became the Western media saying, well, why are reputable 
in theory, reputable Russian news sources, and they layered on a lie, coat of paint by coat of paint, until finally uh, an article appeared in the magazine Foreign Policy, a genuinely reputable magazine that said, none of this is true, none of it is happening. Uh, some detective work back backtracked to the guy who planted the original story, because that was the only source for it ever. Um, he admitted that when talking about the B-61 bomb, he had no idea what one of those was. Uh, and as Jeff Lewis out of the Monterey Center asked, he said, how come Sputnik knew this was, how come Sputnik was calling around about this story before it appeared? It was a planted story. It was seeded. It was astroturfed, as, the, as they say in the business. It was astroturfed out there to look like natural grass by planting it in a bunch of websites. And then you report on the websites, and then you report on the reporting. We want, we want to talk to you a little bit more about this. We do need to take a moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. We're produced at the studios of Rhode Island PBS and broadcast each week on Sirius XM Channel 124, the POTUS Channel. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selvey Regina University with G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. We're talking to Tom Nichols, Professor of National Security Affairs at the U.S. Naval War College an author of the forthcoming book, The Death of Expertise. We're going to talk about that book in a second, but just following up on, the, um, on this case of, of America, uh, uh, you know, false reporting that America was going to move its nuclear weapons out of Turkey. Um, beyond just fealty to the truth, which mm -hmm. I think you know, most journalists would say that that's, what, that's, that's the purpose they serve, I'm assuming. Um, uh, beyond just fealty to the truth, why are th why is fake news? Why are these stories dangerous? The Russians aren't really trying, and other people who push fake news. And by the way, I think we should be very careful to point out that fake news is not news that you don't happen to like. Mm -hmm. or, and it's certainly not an error or a retraction or a correction. It is a intentionally invented out of whole cloth lie. It's fiction. It's fiction, completely. Um, and the Russians and the others who are doing this, they're not trying to get you to believe in a certain line. They're trying to get you to believe in nothing. They're trying to paralyze your critical ability to think. Because what they really want from Western audiences is for them to become so jaded, so cynical, so distrustful that they withdraw from the public sphere, that they withdraw from engaging with journalists or scholars or others who would tell them the truth. And to simply say, a pox on all your houses, nothing is true. Well, I would submit that happen, has happened. It, it's already underway. That was, clearly a, that was clearly a factor in the election. Without doubt. And, it, it and you're right, it wasn't just, people just retreated, went back into the silos, back on their computers, back onto, you know, whatever channels or websites that reflected their points of view. Everybody and, lies. Everybody lies, and I only believe the that, people that I want to believe. And that's one reason why fact-checking in the mainstream media, and I'm not talking about every newspaper, when, when people begin to question whether the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times are like making stuff up, right. or like, you know, like are liberal and they just have such a bias and who cares, that's a bad state of affairs. But let's, be, let's put something on the table. There is spin, there is bias. No question. The, there is bias at the New York Times and Fox News and MSNBC and probably even here at Rhode Island PBS, who knows? The, there is always bias because we are human beings and we are fallible and we have a tendency to tell stories the way they make sense to us. Mm -hmm. That is completely different from assuming ill will. I mean, this is right. an argument I've had, you know, as, a, as somebody who works in national security issues and as a conservative, um, I've had my share of arguments with journalists, but I've always trusted that, and they've always trusted me, that we are trying to get to the truth about something important. This is different. This is the average citizen saying, I, my going in assumption is that you are a liar and that you are intentionally <laughs> lying to me because you hate me. And I think that election, this election was about anger, it was about resentment, it was about a, a certain amount of paranoia, and I think it's a deeply unhealthy thing. And the Russians were doing everything they could to encourage that sense Well, they understood it. They yes, totally they understood. Who, whoever was actually, you know, typing out the fake news or doing whatever, they understood. And they do it. Because they were masters of understanding psychology. This is ultimately psychology, how the human mind works in 2017. And, and what, I, I agree with you completely, and, it, and it's also... Uh, an understanding of what the human mind is incapable of processing beyond a certain point. Because the other thing that is so yeah. striking about this Russian fake news campaign is the sheer volume of it. 
it's meant to overwhelm you. People have asked me mm. when I've brought up the, the fake nuke story, so well, can't fact checking fix this? You can't fax, fact check 100 stories a day. Mm -mm. There are kids in Moscow and St. Petersburg and um, uh, where's the other place? They have a farm, Macedonia, Macedonia. I think, where yeah, they just sit there one. and crank out fake stories all day long. There aren't enough fact checkers in the world. And well, they have to make a living too. And it's those. compounded by this, uh, by the echo chamber effect and the exploitation of social media with bot farms and paid trolls that sort of make a story trend even though it's maybe not an organic trend. It's somebody decided and, we want this to trend. And the thing that's really maddening about social media and um, it, you know, one of the reasons I didn't write more on the fake nuke story is that if you're on social media and you knock the story down, you've repeated it. Yeah. So to knock it down, you have to keep repeating it. And of course, then, then people say, hey, didn't I see uh, Tom Nichols talking about nukes? And <laughs> No, that's not what I said. You're making an association that isn't there. So there's a theme here, and I think it's a theme you know very well, and that really is the death of expertise, yes. which is the title of your book that's coming out very shortly from Oxford University Press. It began with an essay, and I read your essay. And I want to read from it, because I found it very, very powerful. I fear we are witnessing the death of expertise, a Google-fueled, Wikipedia-based, blog-sodden collapse of any division between professional and layman, students and teachers, knowers and wonders. In other words, between those of any achievement in an area and those with none at all. Talk about your book. Well, what struck me is not that this this was just a kind of garden variety hatred of eggheads, right? Anybody who's gone <laughs> to graduate school, you know, if you go I, to, I don't know whether to be insulted or abused. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm one of them. You know, I've been ever since the day, I mean, I, I, ever since the day I got my my entered a PhD program, you know, when one of your friends right. turns to you and says. That means pinhead. <laughs> you know, you say, okay, I get it. You know, have your jokes. Yeah. Um, I tell a story in the book where my uh, my old, older brother ran a bar, and when I was a young professor, I'd come down and visit my brother. And one day, I walked out, and my brother thought it was hilarious. He's a retired police officer, and he told me this story. He said, "You know, walked out, a guy turned to him and said, your brother's a professor, huh?'" No. Seems like a good guy anyway. <laughs> by, 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 by default, he couldn't possibly have been. Oh, okay, that hurts. That's, that's different than what I'm talking about in the book. Yeah. Because a distrust of intellectuals, hey, you know, let's be honest, we've earned some of that distrust. Mm -hmm. We are difficult. We don't speak well uh, and translate well when trying to talk with our fellow citizens. This is different. This is hating experts n based on simply the fact that they are experts and therefore are telling you something you don't want to hear. And the word I use in the book about this very often is narcissism. Because I think the average American has become infected with a kind of vicious narcissism where we can never be told we're wrong, we can never be told that we don't know everything, we can never be told that we've made a mistake. And of course experts are the people that are most likely to tell you that. And people find it infuriating because we have become so delicate and so wrapped in our own echo chambers and so resistant to being told things we don't want to be told that we are very difficult to reason with now as a people. I think that's beautifully put and yeah. again it gets back to psychology. That is a narcissistic trait there is absolutely no question about it. But so what hope nice. then is there for the idea that we as a republic are going to have reasonable debates about serious issues and come to some sort of considered decision as a people that um, we can move forward with. I, I don't know. I tried to be optimistic at the end of the book, and I failed. <laughs> oh, no. Well, another, I, doubt, another doubter ending. At, at the end of the book, I told two, I tried to be bipartisan about this. And again, good time to remind everybody I speak only for myself here. Yeah. And I told two stories. One was about the way, actually, I told three. One was about Brexit, where people voted and almost the next morning <laughs> realized that they had voted for something they, they weren't quite sure yeah, that they wanted. Yeah. Um, I talked about the American election campaign where President Trump point blank said, you know, the experts are terrible. Who needs experts? They're, they're idiots. Uh, but the third one I talked about was <clears throat> Ben Rhodes and the Iran-Contra, uh, excuse me, the Iran um, nuclear deal, mm -hmm. where Rhodes said point blank, 
Well, in long your question, Jim, he said, well, I wish we could have had a reasonable discourse about this, but we can't do that, so we had to create an echo chamber and just fill it with what we wanted, yeah. which to me was just as bad as anything yeah. oh, that the yeah. Brexiteers yeah, yeah. or that the Trump campaign did. That basically said, look, the hell with the American people. They're too stupid to get it. We'll just fill the air with the story we need to tell. And this was you being optimistic. Well, no. Uh, <laughs> but, then I, but then I said, "Well, look, the, the thing that I don't want to hear what he's the thing that, that would stop all of this is if citizens, first of all, if they put their egos away, mm -hmm. and second, took the time to educate themselves and to read a real newspaper, to to watch more than one uh, cable but, channel." It is but the age of narcissism. It is. And does the selfie not describe that age better than anything else? We are the selfie. We, we are. I don't even want to say the selfie generation. We are the selfie world now. We are. Uh, and that if it isn't immediately comprehensible to yourself, then it's not worth knowing. And flattering to myself. And, and reinforcing flattering. what and, I and believe. And reinforcing what I already believe. What I already is, believe. My uh, mind is closed. Boom. The, the term we haven't used yet, and I talk about it a lot in the book, is confirmation bias. Right. Con we are oh, living like in a that. world of confirmation bias run right. amok. Wow. So um, is, the, is there very can true. You, even or so even if you don't end on a cheery note in your in your book, can you imagine this ending with anything other than a disaster of some sort? I mean, uh, you know, you, you talk. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you, you've you talked in the in the article I know, and I'm assuming in the book too about sort of the rise of the of the of the vaxxers, right. right? And and where celebrity telling a specific wrong story about the dangers of vaccines leads to the 21st century where you see outbreaks of whoop, whooping cough, yeah. which was you know, nearly eradicated a century ago. Right. So I, I say in the book there, I mean, unfortunately, when society kind of resets itself uh, and has a great revival, because I think the other thing that's important to this is religion mm -hmm. and spirituality and a kind of deeper belief in something than your own um, self-worth and comfort. Um, usually this happens after a war a Great Depression, a pandemic, something that then forces people to re-engage with experts to say, you know, this is, this is actually, we actually need somebody to figure out how to reconstruct an economy. Um, you know, if you look at the 1950s and 60s, experts were ascendant because somebody had to recreate yep. the post-war order. I hope it doesn't come to that. I'm hoping that we uh, uh, somehow can avert that tragic outcome before that. I mean, that's partly why I wrote the book, is as a creed occur to say, look, stop doing this. Yeah. And also for experts to, to live up to their responsibilities to start engaging with the public again, as uncomfortable as it is for us, because you will get called, experts who engage with the public will get called names, their credibility will be called into question and so on, but we have to do it. This is, so we're gonna leave it here with, you know, the potential for a great war and pestilence, so, um, <laughs> but, uh, on a serious note, though, Tom, thank you very much for being with us. He's yeah, Tom Nichols marvelous. of thank the U.S. Naval War College and author of The Death of Expertise. For Wayne and myself and everyone here, thanks for watching. We hope you'll join us again next week for more Story in the Public Square.